thing. Oh, no, no, the back's probably fine, the front. Yep. Are they over there? Okay, there. Yep. Yeah, that's probably better. You can see that. Okay, good. All right. Um, unfortunately, this is too far over here. I'm going to stick this closer to here where I can see. Wait, is this on? You not recording? Um, yeah, we're recording. But line in blinking. The line in is blinking. But so something is on here. Yeah, it's on. Okay. I just don't know if you're recording or not. Yeah, we're recording. Okay, you're good. All right. Yeah. Okay, I'll put this down. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name's Carsten. Some people call me Rasta. Um, I'm here to talk about C. It's not very trendy. It's not very popular. I'm going to try and make it trendy and popular. That's my job. How to how to bring the fashion back. Um, I have written a few things in C before. Um, I wrote a window manager, a terminal emulator, whole UI toolkit, um, video player. Um, I've actually written window manager several times over and so on. So I have a little bit of experience with it here and there. Um, so I'm going to try and share that, some of that with you today. If you have a laptop, please turn it on and make sure you install things. Because this isn't going to be me just telling you to do X. I want you guys to do something. So I'm making the assumption here that this is an open source conference, that you have a laptop that runs Linux or BSD or something similar. Um, if you have something that runs something else, you will have to deal with that. Don't ask me how Mac works. I've never used a Mac. I don't know how they work. I don't know. They're weird things. Huh? It's just BSD. Yeah, but you'll find I have some kind of commands that might not actually exist on a Mac. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't use it. So maybe the terminal will work on a Mac. Beats me. Um, you figure that out, or ask me questions, and I might be able to help you. So, first of all, I do not like actually just speaking to you. I want you to ask questions, to be interactive. You've got a question, ask it. You've got a query. Um, don't sit there and stay confused and be quiet in a corner um, and feel embarrassed and asking a question. It's not bad. It's a good thing. Um, try things. Actually, do stuff. You learn best by poking it and seeing how it wobbles. Um, so poke it and see how it wobbles. And give me comments and any feedback you have, whether you think that's the right way or the wrong way and why you think that. Plus, these discussions actually start a chain of talking about a topic and then maybe learning about something. So don't be shy to do that. So, oh, I didn't actually do this yet because the network here didn't work. Um, I'll try to do it now, actually. Da -da 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 -da. Seconds. Ah, there you've done it again. Uh, unfortunately, I can't. This slide isn't going to work. Um, okay. Um, and for, I would like. I'll put this up later when I have a network that works. Unfortunately, they're blocking SSH. Oops, it's not full screen, is it? Do, 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 there we go. Um, they're blocking SSH, so I can't upload this. <laughs> Um, this is all the examples and source code for this session. Um, I tried to upload it this morning here. Sorry, <laughs> wouldn't allow me to. Um, something's wrong. I don't know what. So C is actually probably the most popular language in the world. When you speak about popularity in the amount of code that would be running on your average server, your average PC, even on most phones and embedded devices, the vast majority of that is probably C code. You might not see it, you might not know it, but it's running. In terms of the amount of code executed all day long, it's done in this language. It's quite old, and being old, it's actually a language a lot of other languages are inspired by. They build on top of it. A lot of syntax of languages like Java, JavaScript, um, the, even D, or C++ as well, of course, are based on C. Um, they basically used the same syntax. C, of course, was based on B um, before it. There was actually a language called A, I believe. I don't know back then. I wasn't actually doing things until C. Um, so, but it is basically where everything comes from. If you learn this and you understand this, most other languages are fairly easy to deal with. They're an extension of it. So that's a good thing. Another reason it's really important is 
major things like the Linux kernel on C. Well, I was actually having this discussion with people here um, during the conference. And the chances of you replacing something like Linux kernel in another language are approximately zero. Because you'll first have to rewrite what's there, which is tens of millions of lines of code. And then that will probably take 10 or 20 years to rewrite catch up, because the kernel won't stand still for 20 years. So if the kernel is to be maintained in future, you need people who understand C. So this bring, brings me to another nice little line. It's something that the people at the Linux Foundation always quote. There are no kernel programmers who have individually submitted more than three patches, ever. Because after the third patch, you get hired by somebody. Basically, if you know how to work on the kernel and you get patches in, you get hired. Basically, it's a guaranteed job. Asterix, there is apparently one crazy guy who has submitted lots of patches and refuses to be hired by anybody. <laughs> but everyone who works on the kernel gets hired. Um, so it's actually a good job. And the Linux kernel is everywhere. It is basically today the kernel of the world. It runs on most phones, on mountains of embedded devices, on probably the vast majority of smart TVs, smart watches, servers, and even some PCs and laptops. Um, it's only in PC and laptop land that it isn't the majority. Everywhere else, it's basically one. So very important. Most of the things built on top of the kernel and the next layers up are all done in C. So for several layers up, you will find more and more C code up there. And that just multiplies the amount even more. The embedded space is very heavily C um, because you need something small, lean, and mean um, that can run on small microcontrollers, etc. The other big benefit about C is it basically teaches you how the machine works. If you get good at C, you know how a machine works. If you know how machines work, you know how to make things actually very optimal. Because at the end of the day, performance is related to how your machine works. It's not related to, like, you know, do you have the most beautiful algorithm in the world, or is your code really pretty and nice to read and review? It's based on really how well it runs on that machine. So understanding machines lets you write more optimal code in languages other than C. But learning it through C is not a bad idea. For me, C was always a fun challenge. Admittedly, before I started C, I did a lot of other low-level stuff. But it's a challenge to live at that, to work at that level and actually get things right. The good thing about it is it teaches you good habits. So to avoid bugs, you have a certain way of doing things so the bug doesn't happen. So for example, I don't leak memory, I don't allocate it, and then forget to free it, because I write the allocate, then I write the free, then I go back up one line and insert my code in the middle. So I don't actually ever forget. It's just a habit that you create, and after a while you don't think about it. Learning good habits means you write better code with less bugs. So, um, but it doesn't mean you have to do everything in C. Other languages are good for other things. If you really care about programmer productivity, C is not the best language necessarily. The number of hours you spend doing something. But if you care really about the result of your product and how efficient, lean, mean, etc., it is, it probably is actually a very good language. Unlike a lot of other languages and runtimes, C doesn't limit your performance. So if you're going to use Java, you still have a whole VM and a JIT to go through that may or may not produce optimal code, etc., etc., etc. C, well, and its cousins like C++, etc., they will allow you to produce perfectly optimal code. But it's only you that stands in the way, not the runtime. Whereas you use Python, it's always going to be slow, and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, so you're the only one who's in charge of making things good. And also, C is great if you're very unhipster today. So since it's not hip, it's good. <laughs> I like it. Um, so why would you listen to me? Well, let's see. I've done more than 20 years of C. Uh, before that, I actually did about six years of 68K assembly. Um, I've written most of my code living on Linux. It actually is ported to Windows and actually runs on Mac OS 2 for the Mac users here. Um, I have no Apple products at all at home, so I don't actually see it, just people tell me it does. Um, I have a Windows VM I tested in. I just boot it up and run it and say, oh, it works. And then I swear at Windows for a bit and shut it down. Um, and I've actually done a lot of ARM work as well. Um, in the more recent decade or so. A lot of neon uh, assembly as well for optimizing and doing graphics and things like that. Um, so I've done a fair bit of code. I've probably written somewhere in the re region of about a million lines of C. Um, so the libraries and 
Window Manager I work on total probably about 1.5 million lines of code these days, um, all done in C. So I've done a bit. I've, I've been through a few war, wars doing this. Also, I'm old and grumpy. Ah, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm old and wise. Um, <laughs> another reason to listen to me. Um, so what you need today, you'll probably need a terminal, like something to run stuff in. Um, you'll need some sort of text editor. Uh, you'll need Emacs or Vim or Vi or Nano or Jed, or just use an IDE and use Eclipse if you want to be lazy, um, or whatever works for you. Go and find something. You will need a compiler. Today, basically, your compiler is like GCC or Clang. Yes, Microsoft actually do a compiler. Um, it only runs on Windows, so I was going to say it's a niche market, so to speak. Um, and there are a few other really niche compilers. There's actually TCC, Tiny C compiler, but the main ones, GCC and Clang, pretty much own the compiler world. So have one of those. And you need to tap dancing shoes. We're going to dance. No, we're not. I'm just kidding. Um, so this will be your basic first C program. Um, that's it. You compile it that way. CC is the standard C compiler command. Even if you install GCC, CC still works. It's a symlink pointing to GCC. Um, it's kind of just what everyone agreed on from the early days. So you compile it, and if the compiler succeeds, ampersand, ampersand, run the code. So that's kind of the lazy man shell scripting in C, so to speak. Um, you can literally just compile and run on the same line. And it'll compile so quickly it may as well be a shell script in these days. So all that does is run an application and say hello world. Um, it pretty much makes sense, right? Everyone gets that. By the way, question. Who here has never actually programmed before? OK. Who here has actually done any C? One, two, OK. Three, OK. Um, the people who've done C, is it like beginner, intermediate, or expert? Beginner? OK, so beginner slash intermediate. And? Yeah, so I can't remember much. Oh, OK, right. Um, <laughs> all right, right. But so who here has done things like Java? Yes? Yes? Python? Yep. Um, Ruby? Yeah, um, so you've done a smattering of other languages. So OK, we're good. Um, so basically, call function. Give the function a string to do something with it, and presto, out it comes. That's really simple. So what I missed before is I didn't handle the arguments. So every program is passed arguments. This is pretty much the standard between all operating systems. Arguments are basically a series of strings, argument one, argument two, argument three, argument four, and so on, et cetera, et cetera. The first argument is always yourself, i, the executable. And then it's always the next one along that's your first argument. So if we go that way, we start at argv1. Arrays in C start at 0. In most languages, they start at 0, unless you're in Lua land, where they like to start at 1 for whatever strange reason. I don't know. Um, so this basically looks at your first argument and just ha hands that as a string to the print output. In C, the standard print function, printf, which uses a format that says take this string here and then modify it by replacing the following elements with the things I'm about to give you. Um, so percent %s would be a string there. So it takes the first string and puts it in. And so if you run source bob, it'll say, hello, bob. Um, pretty simple. And if you printed argv0, and if you try that now, you will get source <laughs> instead of bob. You'll get the actual executable. And if you put argv2, you might get a crash, or you might get an null pointer. I don't know. It depends on your system, but it's undefined. Because if you check the argc value, which we don't do here for simplicity, and warning, don't nitpick my code over these things. I've specifically not checked lots of things to keep the code simple and short. You should do more checking of these things always in your real code. I've only done it for illustration purposes. Um, so argc there would actually say 2, which means 0 and 1, either there's a count of 2 of your args are valid. Um, so this is pretty common, arrays of strings. You get one the moment you start a program. It's useful to know. So now let's go and improve this a little bit more. Oh, oh, sorry, what does the star star mean again? Oh, sorry, okay. I, 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 actually, I was, I'm going to get to that in a bit. Um, I had to do it because 
the hard bit is that I have to start talking about pointers. <laughs> and pointers I wanted to do a little bit further along <laughs> than right at the moment you pass go. Um, because it's basically a pointer to a pointer, double pointer. Um, I'll get to that in a bit. But basically think of it, it's an array of strings. I could do char, argv, open square bracket, close square bracket, and it would do the same thing. Um, in C, they are the same kind of thing. If there's one important thing in C to master, it's pointers. And in my experience, people get it or they don't get it. And people who don't get it generally don't understand the concept of indirection. So if you can't understand indirection, your life as a programmer is going to be horrible. <laughs> You're not going to like programming. It's going to suck, especially doing anything complicated. So understanding pointers is a key to understanding indirection. You understand indirection, and guess what? Programming is much easier. It's less of a challenge. So very important to understand pointers, but I'll get to them in a bit later. So here, instead this time, uh, da, 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 what do I do here? That's right. Um, I will just first of all print the first, um, sorry, um, the first command, as we were discussing before. So you know what it is. It's just as illustration. I'll tell you how many arguments you're passed. And then we'll run a for loop. So C has for loops, while loops, all sorts of other constructs. I'm only going to cover a few here. We only have two hours. I could do this for like 20. I could do it probably for several days. Um, so basically, we do a loop. We have an integer. We start at 1, because that's where arguments actually really start. And then we just start printing it. So we replace a string. We put a space next to it. And then finally, at the end, the backslash n is a new line. So to make sure we don't have a line between each of these things, we don't print the new line, and then we just throw it in at the end. So you can print your arguments. So that would be how you iterate over an array, and you're going to pump it out. Um, and then, oops. So now I want to types. Um, C is a type language, unlike some scripting languages. Data types have a format and a size. Um, one of the more common ones is an int. It's an integer. Gener I'm going to now be generally speaking, it's 32 bits or 4 bytes. So you'll get a value of either minus 2 billion to 2 billion or so, or 0 to 4 billion, depending if it's unsigned or signed, um, depending which way you look at it. And the way it's done is actually two's complement. Um, I'm not going to go into detail of two's complement, but just think that. 0 up to about 2 billion, and then when it goes beyond that, it wraps around to the largest negative value. Oh, sorry, it wraps around and then um, starts going negative, and then when you go to the largest value, you'll actually be at minus 1, just before 0. So you just kind of move the 0 point somewhere else in your range. Two's complement effectively works that way. Um, and almost all, the binary, all binary types basically do this. There used to be other ways. We have a sign bit and so on, but two's complement became how hardware does this. Um, we got chars, another really common type. It's basically a byte. Um, it's eight bits, often used to store characters, like string characters, but it doesn't mean it's only characters. It can be any eight bit sign type. Warning, on ARM, char is actually unsigned by default. On most other platforms, it's signed by default. Um, if you don't put a signed or unsigned in front of it. So if you really care about it being signed, you have to put a signed in front of it. So the same thing, 0 to 225, that's what 8 bits can store, or 0 to hef in hex. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so there's no native type for like the Unicode. How do you do Unicode? Unicode. Emoji. Int. You just int for emoji. Of course. Yeah. Do you know the Unicode standards? You, so the Unicode standards, before they started extending, you need about 21 bits to store everything in the Unicode range. But people have been extending this now. So I think now you need about 22 or 23 bits. I've got to go back. But either way, 22 or 23 bits isn't 16 bits. It's not 8 bits. So you go to the next one up, which is 32. And it's kind of really cool. I wrote a terminal emulator, and I use the unused Unicode range for metadata. So I use that to tag special cells with extra data so I can do things. I can put videos in the terminal or images or little icons from disk. And I use that unused range because Unicode's not using it. So yeah, it's a 32-bit value, an int per, per character. But you're talking, that's a Unicode. The Unicode only defines the character set. Like 0 is, well, actually, 
end of string. It's defined that way, or nothing, null. And then so on, the first 128 is actually ASCII. So that has you 0 to 7, uh, 0 to 9, A to Z, blah, 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 all the name of ASCII characters. And then beyond that, you start getting more ranges. It only defines your value. It doesn't define encoding. Now, encoding, you might make a mix up with Unicode. Encoding is how do you represent these Unicode values in a series of data, a series of bytes in memory or on disk. Um, there have been many ways. At one point, there was the 16-bit um, Unicode, which ended up being not enough for Unicode because they went past 16 bits. So that's why today Windows does UTF-16. So UTF-16 is a way of using unused bits before and extending it so a character is multiple bytes. In Unix, they never went to 16-bit by default, but Windows did to try and let's solve Unicode once and for all, which didn't happen. And so Unix never went there. There were all these encodings. Like there's probably like oh, 200 or 300 different kinds of encodings for text that are commonly done. If you've got a machine now, type in iconv. I believe iconv minus L will list the encodings it handles and just get a big blob of every possible encoding. But this is like UTF-8. I was going to get to that. But today, Unix basically went, we're doing UTF-8 because it's basically taking ASCII and extending it. So it's either what it's totally ASCII compatible but then you can extend it using multiple byte sequences to handle the extra ones. Um, so, so a lot of the time it'll be one byte, one byte, then maybe three bytes is quite common, the next one's up and so on. So, so with this, you start with, you start with car, car and then when you go over it, you go to end or something? No, what happens, so for UTF-8, it's just a series of cars. So char, char, char. And you have to look at the first char and based on its bits and values, is the next char the next character or is it extending the current value? Then you read them, you munge them together, you get a Unicode value at the end of the day, and then you go and print that. Um, so, so you can encode an, an emoji with, with cards, basically? You can, but you'll need UTF-8, basically. And today, actually, UTF-8 has become almost a de facto standard on everything outside of Windows. You get Windows is UTF-16, and the internet, most of web standards, all the Unixes, etc., they pretty much have decided UTF-8 because it was ASCII compatible. Also, it's actually very compact most of the time. When you have to transfer non-high you know, high value Unicode values, it actually compacts better. It is an absolute royal pain in the rear for programmers because now, what's character number 16 in this string? I don't know. You have to actually walk it from beginning and go as you go to find which one is and you're going to decode as you go to know. It's painful. Whereas before it was fixed, you just go to byte number 16. Or if in, um, when you had the um, UCS2, which was the two bytes per character, i.e. 16 bits, you go to byte number 32. There isn't like a type that makes those operations easier? No. No. In this language? No. No, no, no wait, 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 wait. Uh, that, I'll get to that to the very, near the very end. Okay. I'll, I'll come to that. In C, you don't get the types. You don't get the language picking up all the pieces for you. It provides the real basics. What you have is libraries. Libraries do this work for you. Libraries say, give me a UTF-8 string, and I'll give you a Unicode string of ints as a result. You don't have to know or care. I'll deal with that for you, and I'll do the reverse. I'll pump out UTF-8 for you, etc. I can walk UTF-8 characters for you, like go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the previous one, and it'll decode as it goes. So you can use libraries that do that. I know that. I wrote them. <laughs> I've done that, I've written these libraries. And what I do is I write the library, I make it work, I debug it, and then I use it and I stop writing that code. I can remember what it did when I wrote it six years ago, kind of vaguely, so I can tell you about it, but then I just start using it. So the trick to doing really effective C, once you've mastered the basics, is using libraries. Unless you really want to go write your own libraries. But sometimes you do. Sometimes a library doesn't solve something the way you want them to want to solve it. And that's the point about knowing basics. If you know your basics, you can build your own solution. You can take some modify it to have the solution you want. And not just modify it, maybe if it's a good change and it's clean and neat, send it back, up, back upstream to improve the library for everybody else. So you don't have to maintain that code anymore. It just works and everyone else can benefit too. And then if everyone does that together, you end up with quite a lot of good code. So there's quite a lot of good libraries that do these things for you. Um, but I'll get to that kind of towards the end. It's kind of getting towards the more advanced topic end. So um, if everyone looks at the ASCII manual page, man ASCII, it'll give you a table of what the values are for all the ASCII characters. This is probably something most programmers should actually know. <laughs> you don't have to know every value, but have a rough idea of what the ASCII table looks like. 
So if I actually want to declare a string in C, a char star, which is a pointer to something, a pointer to chars, a pointer to characters, or an array, an array is actually just, if I refer to the array, I refer to the pointer to the, the, the first member. So it effectively is the same thing. So if I were to define a string like that with um, actual da -da -da, um, characters put in each element, the first line would be explicitly six. If I did the second one, the C, per, the C compiler will automatically figure out how big it is because you've given it content. It'll know how big to make it. The third one, I can just give it an actual string and it'll figure out how to do that too. And the last one, the pointer to it, is exactly the same as all of the others. And in memory, you just have a series of bytes with those, at in, uh, those decimal values in it, which represent stuff. Strings are just numbers. They're not magic strings. Strings are not this magic new different thing. They're just numbers. Everything is just numbers, actually. Oh. So OK, here's pointers a little bit. Oh, yes. How did you convert that in C, your letters to uh, the number of how did I convert it? Yeah. Well, I looked it up in the ASCII table and wrote it down for you there. No, I get no. In, if you if you print F it, if you were to print F it, so you can read the output, print F percent C will print it as a character, print F percent I, and it'll print it as a number. <laughs> so you can get that out. It's very very easy. But they're actually in memory are just numbers. It is just numbers. A string or a character and a number, they're no different. You're just arguing about how many bits in that. How big is it? That's all it is. You know, I think a lot of people may not appreciate just how simple C is. And often they go, well, how do you do this? You don't. It doesn't exist. <laughs> you don't have to do it. It's all really basic. So you master the basics, and everything gets built on top of the basics. So, and if you master the basics, you can do assembly, and you can maintain kernels, because you know how to do this stuff. <laughs> it's good. So pointers are really important. Pointers do what they say. They point to something. They say, this thing is there. It's like an, it's an address, it literally actually called addresses. But think of it like a street address. Um, it's saying, this thing lives at 120 you know, Bob Street. And it's telling you that's where it is. So pointers can say, this is over here. A pointer can say, go to this address, find me the piece of paper over there, and that points to the next address, and that points to the next address, and that points to the next address. So you follow the chain of pointers till you find the thing you're after. And pointers to pointers to pointers to pointers are a real thing in code. You actually do this stuff. It's actually very, very useful to do this. And playing pointer games is really, really fun. You can do really interesting things with them. Um, I've got, if you want, I can tell you beautiful stories about them later. <laughs> oh, yes? No. Um, a pointer is... A po oh, wait, wait, wait. So you can have pointers to pointers to pointers. Right? And you can never end, but I'll get to that in a sec. Um, and da -da -da -da. Right, so remember, I, I'm going to get to this in a bit, but pointer is just a number. It's nothing but an integer. Well, okay, asterisk. Is well, actually, it's a command. It's a do this, and then it's a kind of jump to a number, an address, <laughs> a place in memory. But the actual pointer itself is just a number. On a 32-bit system, it is 32 bits. <laughs> On a 64-bit system, it is 64 bits. Um, it just is a number of that size. Asterisks on today's modern systems, they might have the pointers be 64-bit, but they only allow you to use about 48 bits of it as the actual pointer. The other ones, they don't allow you to. Um, in modern Intel, modern x86 only gives you 48 bits for the pointer. The other bits are actually unused at the moment. So on a modern 64-bit machine, if you look at pointers, you know it's a pointer, but you print it out, and you can see a range of zeros in there, and you go, ah, that's a pointer, or FFFFs and so on. Because you go, ah, I know what pointers look like when you print them out. So you go, ah, I smell a pointer right there. Um, so it's a number. Like everything else, it's a number. You get to know and recognize your numbers. You can really debug things effectively. You can look at memory dump and go, doo -doo -doo, well, that's a pointer. <laughs> oh, oh, that's that all characters there, blah, blah, blah. Back in my days, this is like when I was a kid, this is how we hacked games. You took a floppy disk, you dumped it, and you hunted it for code. You hunted it for the copy protection code. You looked for things that looked like SM like machine code, the actual opcodes you knew. And you go, wait, oh, if that's a jump instruction. That's an, oh, that's, ah. Oh. And then you can figure out the bit that does a copy protection, change the machine code to just skip it to where what's after. Presto, copy, uh, copy protection removed. Um, <laughs> so, but knowing your numbers allowed you to do this. 
though these are the people who would write, do you remember the days, have you ever heard of like 4K and 64K demos? Where people would write these programs, the entire program was four kilobytes, everything, all data, and they did amazing things on screen. Because they knew their numbers, they knew how to deal with hardware registers, they knew how to compress things, how to compact things, how to use less instructions, blah, 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 blah. Knowing your numbers allows you to do really incredible, amazing things. So, um, anyway, um, but just keep in mind, the more in directions you have the pointers, the more memory you access. Accessing memory is not free. It costs. So getting something from main memory may be in the range of 100 to 200 clock cycles. That means of those 4 gigahertz, you lose 200 of those gigas just sitting there and waiting for something to come from memory. So it's expensive to go get something from memory. That's why we have caches in between, blah, 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 to try and speed that up. But nevertheless, the more memory you access, the slower your world gets. And it's the same with pointers. So the more pointers you indirect via, there isn't any magic that compresses it down to one single indirection. It's your job to find a single indirection if you want that, if you want to have that optimization. Um, but every one is going to cost you because it has to go and do that indirection. Um, it's not free. Just a little um, an aside, there was something we did in our project to try and save memory because we found certain parts of our data structures were the same values again and again and again and again. Because they're kind of default values and sometimes someone changes those fields to be something different. It's kind of rare, not common. So what we did is we actually created on copy on write. We moved that to be a pointer to another data structure somewhere else that everyone shares. So it's one data structure in memory for all those default values and only when someone modifies it do they copy and make a custom copy themselves that then needs to be freed. Interestingly enough, by reducing our memory footprint, our rendering speed went up by 5% because we just accessed less memory during rendering. So reducing how much memory you access will give you a speed up. If you want to live in the world where performance really, really matters, you have to care about these things. So going low level and knowing how your memory is laid out and how to compress things and get things to use less memory, very useful. Next. Um, so before I also covered printf before that you saw, um, a few versions, but whenever you see a percent in it, unless it's percent, um, it's converting something. It's saying, please put an integer here, a string here, percent C is a char, percent P is a pointer, um, percent D is also the same as an integer, um, and then you can have percent LI, um, which is a long integer, um, etc., etc. There's There's a whole manual page on these. I'm not going to cover it, but Printf is really useful. You're going to use it all day long. Printf debugging is a thing, and it actually is very useful at times. Can, so, can it tell you what type it is, the memory? But you, that actually is it. The i is an integer. So 32-bit. But, but if you didn't know it was an integer, you have to know. Okay. You have to know. <laughs> That's your job. Uh, yes? How does a pointer point to multiple things? Like a char pointer can point to multiple characters? Ah, it points to the first one. So how do you know when to stop? Ah, okay, how, okay, oh, I, I skipped that. I'm terribly sorry. You're right. Good, you bring it up. So it points to the first one. The first one's here. The next one is the next byte after that. Next one's the byte after that. Next one's a, So when you print the string, you just so byte, 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 byte. And when you find a byte whose value is zero, that's the end of the string. So common bug in C world that can lead to buffer overflows and things like this is you forget to put a zero at the end. You fill a string, you fill a buffer with a string, you forget to add the zero. So what happens is someone then uses that string and they start reading and they read off the end of the buffer and start reading all through memory and eventually crash or do something because you didn't put a zero there. It might eventually encounter a zero in memory and stop by itself. It might do it before any damage has happened. But maybe it doesn't, maybe it walks off the end and in your crashes. Slides, the way that you define the string automatically puts that at zero. Um, when you put it as a string, yes. You'll notice in one of the array, in two of the arrays, I actually added the zero by hand before. So it was kind of hidden in there. I didn't actually point it out. But yes, it's the zero that, um, that ends the string. So always remember, null terminate your, st your strings. If you don't do that, bad man. So, so the same for arrays also, right? The last, the terminating zero will end array? No, no, no. That, that, that's a convention for strings. A string is just an array of chars. And the convention is we know the string has ended if there's a zero, a zero byte. For other arrays, you don't know the size of the array. You get a pointer to the beginning. You have to be told the size separately. So often, what, that's why you'll notice there's a function sn printf. 
It's basically don't printf to output, print to a memory buffer to generate a string in memory. Very, very useful for many purposes. Um, and s, s printf writes to a buffer. And you just give it a pointer a buffer and fill it. What's the problem with just giving a pointer to a buffer? You don't know the size. So if you use s printf and you're not absolutely 100% sure that the amount you're going to print in is less than the size of your buffer, and you can guarantee that, then you should use sn printf. sn says s and the n is for providing n as in size of array. So you put in buffer, then you put in size as the next parameter, and then you do the rest of the stuff after that. So size is always passed along with the, um, with the array. Note that in real life, you don't actually need that size all the time. You often have other ways of knowing the size. Like, for example, you've got an image, you don't give the size of the array, you know the dimensions of the image in pixels. If I give you the base pointer, I know where the whole thing, blob of memory ends by multiplying my two sizes, multiplied by my size of pixel thing, and then I know how big that is. In fact, I will just never walk outside of those bounds because that'll lead to a crash. So you decide how you pass that information. Maybe it's passed in via other data structures, maybe it's in the global var variable, some other way of knowing it. With strings, it's kind of their variable length bits of memory, and you walk till there's a zero. You figure it out, but you can come up with lots of imaginative ways of doing this. And then it could be that you have a pointer, and the first thing you point to is the size, and then everything is trailing after that. I mean, you can invent all sorts of ways, but that's how you can compress things or make things more efficient by choosing a method of representing your data that works best for your situation. So, um, oh, wait. oh yeah, I covered four loops before. Um, where is it? That highlight should be there. Why isn't the highlight there? Anyway, um, so I covered for loops before. Um, in C, for loops are actually quite powerful. Um, they can do a lot. So for loops basically have three conditions. They have a start condition. What's your initial state? They have a condition for should this loop continue? And they have a condition for how to iterate the loop, what to do. So your really bog standard, out of the box first loop anyone ever tells you is 4i equals 0, i equals less than some number, i plus plus. Um, so that's basically set the variable i to 0 at the start. Then every time at the end of the loop, check if i is actually less than 10. And if it is, um, then do the iterate, like the i plus plus. I increase this by 1, and then go to the beginning of the loop again and continue. The cool bit is, you can make them do, you know, do two things at the same time, like go through two variables simultaneously. Start i at 0, j at 10. If i is less than 10 and i is greater than 5. Oh, sorry. Oh, that should be, ah, sorry, that should be j is greater than 5. I'm terribly sorry, typo. Um, if j is greater than 5, increment i plus 1 and decrement j by, by 1. And then that'll only increment go over a certain subpart of the loop. You can make these as complicated as you like. And I've done interesting ones that walk through linked lists, that walk through complex string arrays, that do lots of interesting stuff for the iterations. If you know how to use for loops, they're just a nice handy construct um, to save you time. But the common ones are the first basic one. So as long as you understand that you can do more with them, and then you explore that later, good. Um, so back to machine, now to machine concepts. In reality, your machine is pretty much this, from your point of view. There's a CPU. It does math and make decisions, and it talks to RAM, and there's a lot of storage. That's it. That's what a machine is. We're done. You now know how a machine works. That's basically a machine. Um, OK, there's a little bit more than that. <laughs> you've got a CPU, and it talks to RAM. Then you've got a GPU, and it may talk to RAM via DMA, via just might use it be living in memory, like straight onto the memory bus. It may be on a separate card over a PCI bus that can actually map memory and talk to it. Um, your network cards. They will do the same thing. They will probably have DMA engines, and they'll write to memory, and they'll read from memory. Um, the disk, same thing. If you have a system that doesn't do a very slow system, you do not want to have that. That's a horrible place to be. Um, so most hardware will actually have some kind of DMA. And it's a CPU's job to tell every other unit what to do and when to do it. I, please disk control a load block X from here on disk and write it to here in memory. And the CPU set tells it to do that. It basically, most of the hardware actually has another piece of memory you map. And in that memory, it registers for the hardware. And the CPU just writes to that memory to give it information, like base address, um, block number, 
transaction type, blah, 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 and then that gets written out, either on a command queue or directly, it's just when you write the last register, the operation begins. Um, so the system still... Like, wait, 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 no, I was talking hardware registers. That's how it talks to the hardware, like net and new network disk and so on. I'll come to that in a bit. There are more diagrams for that. Um, but effectively, think of it from a programmer's point of view. You just have a blob of memory to store stuff in, and you have a CPU to basically fetch from that, do some processing, and write back out to it um, to make decisions. That's what the world is. Interestingly enough, the people who make a GPU think the same way. They think the world is like a CPU, but inside the GPU, and they work on the world in exactly the same way. The disk controller guys kind of pretty much do the same way. They all run firmware, they run a kind of software of their own, and they think that way. So everyone's sharing this big place to put stuff. Um, memory is where it goes. Now, this is where I said I start coming with that. Um, RAM is generally really, really slow. You might not think that. You might think, no, God, no, hard drive's slow. Well, actually, I find slow, floppy drives are slow, and then tape drives are even slower than that. Um, but no, in the scheme of things, RAM is actually very, very slow. It's not very fast, but it is big. It's huge. You can put a lot of stuff in it. And then to make things faster, your CPUs have more memory inside. Today, you actually will find in a lot of the bigger desktop CPUs an L3 cache. Um, on the embedded, not so much. Um, L2 caches and L1 caches. And each one gets smaller as you go. The diagram doesn't say that. Um, the L3 cache is slow, but still faster than RAM. And it's quite cheap to make. And therefore, it's quite big, because they can afford to put a lot of it in. Your L2 cache is more expensive. Therefore, they put less of it in, but it's faster than L3. And L1 is yet faster, more expensive, and thus smaller. L1, normally these days, you find 64K is what you have. It may be split into 32K data, 32K instruction, but you'll have 64K. Sometimes it's shared, sometimes not. Um, so 64 kilobytes is not very much, and L1 cache is reasonably fast. But then in, what you really have is registers, and registers are what are really fast. Registers are zero access. Um, you can basically get to them immediately. Whatever's in a register, you can work with right away. But Dart has to get to the register, work with it. And when you're done with it, it's got to go somewhere else. I back out to memory. Um, so we're going up and down. You know, data goes flushed through these caches all the time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the registers you were asking about before. Um, they sit there inside the CPU. Two questions. What, what makes it expensive? Is it like different material or different clock cycle? Or what are the... The way the way the way the um, the transistors are designed, they consume more transistors. Um, they're just and they therefore it's more space on the die, um, and they have to basically move it with shorter runs to the ALUs, the ar ar the other uh, arithmetic uh, logic units, um, rather than further away. And, and does that, does that um, do you actually use? Address these L3, L2, L1? No, no, they're, 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 no these, they, these are invisible to you, oh, okay. generally speaking, asterisks. But it is actually something you should know, because basically you have to ask yourself, I've got some data, where is it going to live? And you've got to think, how big is the data? If it's really big, it's not going to live in L1 cache. It might not live in L2 cache. It might not even live in three L3. It might have to live out in memory. And it means if you keep just rummaging through a huge amount of data, you get very little caching speed ups because you basically nullify the caches by having such a large data set. But, but if you only access a small section of that data and you access it repeatedly, your current data set, then that works really, really well. So sometimes designing your data to fit inside a cache is a really smart thing. Um, now, I'm going to jump over to GPU land. So do people here know how GPUs arrange memory these days? Oh, no, no, wait, wait, no, no, there's a reason for caching. I'm going to cover caching. So GPUs, what they do is they don't lay out pixels with pixel, 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 pixel in a nice big row like you might think like a linear frame buffer. They arrange them in little tiles. Those little tiles are actually designed so one tile fits in the, in the GPU's cache. The idea is it doesn't fetch a byte or even fetch a cache. Well, it fetches a cache line. But when it fetches a cache line, it fetches an entire tile of pixels. And the reason it wants a 2D tile is GPUs tend to access pixels within a 2D area around each other. Like this pixel, the one next to it, the one next to it, 
often to do linear interpolation and smoothing and stuff like that. Or when you rotate something, you're not always walking horizontally, you're walking diagonally, but you're still walking through a 2D region tile. So they actually do things in tiles to optimize for caching, to make, that, to make those tile caches work really efficiently. And if you design your software and the CPU to work the same way, they can work really, really efficiently too. On, on the GPUs, why, why are the hashes run, run faster than the CPU? Um, because they just, okay, you're, that's where you're getting to now. Your average machine today might have four actual cores. When they say they have eight, they're actually hyperthreading, which means they're creating a virtual core and they're switching that core when it stalls, when it's deciding to wait on RAM to another context and then start executing something else on the same core. And so they basically just hardware switch it over. But you generally have for maybe eight cores, I don't know. Um, on some of the really high-end machines, especially the now ARM servers, uh, the ARM servers are now switching and shipping with 40, two or 44 something cores, like real cores, but that pales in comparison to GPUs. GPUs often have a unit with, um, oh, wait, 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 hear me out. They will have a unit and often they might have four, eight or 16 cores, but an instruction that can do 256, 512, 1024 operations in parallel. So what you do is, because you're hashing, you're doing the same mathematical operation again and again and again. You just say, do the math to this one, and 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 this one. And you basically iterate and step over each step of the algorithm on 1,024 things in parallel. And they have a whole bunch of these units also working in parallel, blah, blah, blah. And that's why GPUs are awesome at parallel stuff. Until you have to branch. Until you have to do if then else. And they suck at if then else. Do you know why? Because when you, do, when you do the if, the whole 1024 things has to switch and do the other case. So they actually have to run both the if and the else. And what happens is they just filter. Some of the units take the if result, some take the else result, but you actually have to iterate over all of them because they're so wide. So that's why they stay awesome at doing hashes because they really don't have to do any of that. They just do math, 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 pump it out. They're awesome at math and pumping it out in parallel. So imagine they had, they had like thousands upon thousands of cores compared to your um, so the, compared to your um, yeah, PC. question is, uh, when you move data between the RAM and CPU, um, mm -hmm. do you, you, have, you have to manage a queue, right? Or no, that's done in hardware for you. Oh, the hardware does. <laughs> the hardware actually knows what has to be flushed out and what's in caches and it will go do that. Yeah. Like when you do, but uh, when you're like interfacing with a piece of hardware like uh, uh, a serial port, mm -hmm. you, you usually have to write a queue, don't you, or something like that. Or you would. It, it depends how it's wired up. The old-fashioned way is there's just a register, and you write to it, and whatever byte you write to it gets pumped out by the hardware. In more modern hardware, you'll just actually write to a series, of, uh, a bit of memory, and you'll say. This bit of memory, now start, and the hardware will read from that bit of memory, that buffer, and just start writing out the bits for you from each byte, and then you'll get an interrupt to say when it's done. Okay, so they basically manage the, 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 the data as it comes to it. Yes, yes. So this, from the CPU's job is, you write the stuff somewhere out to memory. <laughs> That's why the diagram before. You put it somewhere in memory, then you tell a piece of hardware, here in memory, I put it here, go make it work for me. Um, go write it out for me. And whether it's the serial port, it's a hard drive, it's um, GPU, it's pretty much anything else, they pretty much do the same thing. GPUs are probably by far the most complicated piece of non-CPU hardware out there um, by a huge mile. Um, so there's a lot you can do with those. Um, but serial port's actually a nice easy example. So just write this out or reading in, it'll write to a buffer that's been told before, here's the input buffer. Then it'll send you an interrupter saying, I have written, in, I have written bytes to this buffer when it's full, and you might actually have two buffers. So you have the A buffer and the B buffer. And once it's filled the A buffer, it sends you an interrupt saying it's full. And then you go and take that buffer and read from it in the CPU and decide what I to do with it. I don't understand how interrupts work. I mean, how does that come into your... Oh, in, in, in interrupts are a sideline, which basically tells the CPU, hey, something happened, and one of these end lines wakes up. It just says something happened. Oh, right. it, it just calls into a function or something. It, no, it doesn't call. Well, OK. It, there is actually a jump table, basically um, um, an interrupt table that says, if this interrupt comes in, jump to this address and run the code that's there. 
And generally speaking, your kernel will have this. It'll set up all the interrupt handlers, and its interrupt handler will go, oh, this thing happened, and then based on that, decide what to do with it. Um, they'll split it into like an upper half and a lower half where one half is actually really compact and does very, very little. So it allows the interrupt to be unmasked and then continue. And then the second half actually does the load of work, which might be copy the data out or things. So the first one might be, oh, do this, flip buffers to the second buffer, go back. And then tell some other part of the kernel that like the buffer is now able to be read from. And you can, this is how many bytes are in it go deal with it. And this other guy copies it out somewhere else, does something with it. Then he may actually send another interrupt to you. Well, actually, he doesn't send it. He calls user space and switches. And then user space to switch back actually sends an interrupt to say, and then that interrupt switches back to kernel space and so on. But it's pretty much just memory, memory, memory. The interrupt line is a sideline of signaling. And it's actually quite limited. You only have you know, maybe 8, 16, 32, kind of 64, 128 kind of interrupt lines, depending on your hardware and platform and so on, et cetera. OK, um, where was it? Um, here we go. Um, so I think I was covering that. Your data lives in memory. Um, it'll just move back and forth as needed. And that's generally the, the, the job of software to go move it back and forth. And also between hardware, other disk systems, I, other I.O., et cetera, et cetera. Um, all the caches are just ways of making memory look faster than it really is. By things you access often, go live in cache. Note that caches also are fairly coarse. They only fetch memory in things called cache lines. Cache lines these days are approximately 64 bytes. And I think some of the more modern ARMs, they're 128 bytes. Um, and that means if you access just one byte in that memory, it'll, it'll fetch the entire 64 bytes together, then put that into the cache, and now you get to access it. Cool bit is, you access one byte in that cache line, the rest of them are free, because it's already paid the price to move them in. So knowing how your caching works is in fact useful. You design your data structures to be cache friendly. I, if you're going to have to stop and wait on memory, make sure the other things you're going to access immediately after are together in, in, together in memory in the same cache line. So then you access after that are quote, quote, free. Um, there's other beautiful, there's actually CPU instructions to prefetch. I go to the cache and say, cache, please fetch this now. And then you go do something else for a while and come back later and get it. And you hope by the time you come back later, it's already fetched and you don't stall. If it hasn't been fetched yet, you might have to wait. But maybe you wait less because it's already started to fetch. Um, da, 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 da. Um, so keep in mind, processors have very, very few registers. Um, it varies from processor to processor, but normally in the ballpark of four, eight, maybe 16 registers is pretty common. Uh, yes, you might see some modern, but it's generally a fairly limited resource. Um, and so the CPU just reads and writes data and does math. I either actual math or logical math. I if this is this, else that. Um, compare and branch, and that's how it makes its logical decisions. Life is all about comparing numbers. Oh. Go. There we go. So all your data in the world, as I was covering before, is just numbers. Strings are numbers. Your pixels are numbers. Um, your audio is numbers. You, everything in memory is just numbers. Numbers, numbers, numbers. Um, where is your data? It's at numbers. It's at addresses in memory. It just lives at, this data lives at 123 over there. This data lives at 876 over there. This data lives at 5 over there. Well, the numbers are actually much bigger than that, but you get the idea. Everything is numbers. And data is just numbers, numbers, numbers. It's all numbers. Well, why did that go back? And in the world of numbers, the only two numbers exist. Zero and one. There is nothing else. There is no spoon. Um, everything else is built on top of zero and one. Has everyone here at least done learning binary? OK. So OK, you've learned binary. We all know that. Blah, blah, blah. I can skip that. Good. Um, and. Please get used to hex. Hex is good. Do you know why it's good? You'll find out very soon. Um, hex is good because you can nicely represent memory in a way that you as a human could read it, and it still is very machine-centric. And if you know how to learn, read your hex and kind of grasp it and understand it and know your magic values and what they are, um, you will be able to debug and do things far more effectively. So basically, hex is just declaring 16 actual digits. Um, and they just represent binary blobs of four bits. And you can figure out the decimal from that, blah, 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 blah. But it's really base 16 instead of base 10. 
That's all it is. So what is memory? Now, as I was starting to say before, memory is a series of letterboxes. Um, and a letterbox just has a number in it. Your memory has a lot of little letterboxes, like a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper is written a number, written the value, value of 0 to 255, or 0 to FF in hex. And that's a small selection of that. Um, so often your registers these days might be 32 bits, they might be 64 bits on modern machines. So I4 or 8 bytes. There is a SIMD unit. The SIMD unit on Intel's is often the MMX unit or MMX and SSC. And that adds you a bunch of more um, registers there specifically for those instructions. And they actually often can be a bit bigger. Um, some of them actually be as large as 512 bits wide for one of those registers. Oh, um, um, single, instruction, single instruction multiple data. So that's a way of saying take. Um, Does Intel have that? Yes, MMX SSE is that. Oh, MMX. Oh. MMX and SSE is that. On ARM, it's called Neon. That's why it's referred to as SIMD because it's the generic version of it. Um, and so that's why you're basically saying here I've got eight byte numbers take these 8-byte numbers and add them to the 8-byte numbers over here. So it adds this one and this one, this one and this one, this one and this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and then it puts the result down here with all of them added together. And, but it does it in one instruction. So you can add 8 numbers together, 8 pairs of numbers together in one instruction. Um, for example, the really, really wide ones do even more than that. Um, and they might not be 8-byte values, it might be 16-byte or 32-byte, by, by, uh, 8-bit or 16-bit or 32-bit values, and it'll do that. It also, the SIMD units can do extra math, like saturation math. So instead of overflowing and going back below zero, back to zero, it'll stop at the largest value, or actually underflow as well. Um, so they do a bit of extra stuff that's really handy when doing media things. Then you don't actually have to handle dealing with that. Um, so they can be handy, but. Um, Generally, if you're writing C, you probably just are going to write C and your compiler may or may not use these instructions for you to detect something. You can actually explicitly use these. There are things called um, the, like intrinsics. And the intrinsics are basically like function calls. They look like a function call, but they actually are a single assembly command. And that you can access these instructions and these units directly with that. Um, and the compiler will deal with some of the footwork for you around that. But note. The moment you start doing intrinsics, your code is not portable anymore. It'll only run on that architecture. And even worse, you put things like Neon intrinsics there, and you run on a CPU without Neon, you'll crash with a SIGIL, an illegal instruction, because that instruction is unknown. So you can't actually even run that code until you detect what kind of CPU you're on, if that CPU supports those instructions. Eventually, when you do advanced code, you know how to do this, you know how to detect that, and you'll switch code A, which is just pure C, code B, which is C plus intrinsics, and you switch at runtime based on which one you sh can run on the CPU. You can detect this stuff. Um, so as an idea of just how much memory really is, a K 1K is 1024, we all know that. A megabyte is a million of that, and a gigabyte is a thousand times that. Again, it's a lot of bytes out there. So registers are generally very small compared to the amount of memory you have. Um, and your average servers, in terms of your memory footprint, are just huge these days. They can have a lot of memory, as well as even your average powerful PC, or even your phone has mountains of it. Go. Go. Why do you do this? There you go. Um, so the common data types you should know, this is pretty much all of them you really know, need to know. You've got bytes, HRs. You've got shorts, which are two bytes together. Trust me, they actually are useful if you want to reduce the size of things. You've got a piece of data that needs more than eight bits, but it doesn't need a full 32 bits. And your 16-bit values, your shorts, are very useful for that. And if you use them carefully, then you can actually save quite a lot of memory um, doing things sensibly. Your ints are four bytes, generally speaking. I know if you want to go and quote the actual K and RC in the thing, that isn't a guarantee that you only know that a char is a machine at least the size of a byte on the machine, um, and so on. There were days when you had via VAX machines where I think chars were 36 bits or something like that. What was it? The ints were 36 bits and the chars were 7 bits. I don't remember. But either way, stuff was weird then. Today, on any architecture you really are going to find, that is going to be the case. 
Now, longs, can, longs may vary depending on your, whether you're 32 or 64-bit. If you're on 64-bit, they will be 64-bit. Asterisks, not on Windows. On Windows, longs will stay 32 bits. But you have to deal with the fact they may change in size. Um, your long longs are always going to be 8 bytes, and your floats are 4, your doubles are 8. Just small little asterisks here. Intel, the Intel floating point unit actually has more than 8 bytes of precision. It actually has 80 bit registers. So you may actually get different results when you're doing things on Intel with floating point than you might on another architecture because it can do things to slightly more precision. Thus it might round up or down differently compared to another thing. Even compile the same because they have different size register. So if it's keeping the data in registers, it'll keep a bit more precision. But when it goes back out to memory, it has to go back down to 64 bits or for 8 bytes. Um, there are compiler flags to force it to keep it into 64 bits. And pointers, of course, vary in size as well. Go! There we go. I've got space bar. It'll do. Um, so pointers are just a number, um, as with everything else. They just tell you, as you were asking before, memory starts. This is the start of the thing. That's what they're used for. But they don't have to only point to the start. They can point somewhere to the middle of something. If I, I want you, if you are a function, and I want you to access some piece of data that's inside this big buffer I have, I don't have to give you the base pointer of the buffer and then some other information, like an offset and a size. I say, the data's here in memory already. It's over here. Go get it. And so I can just pass you the pointer straight to where it is. It doesn't have to be the start of the thing. It can be anywhere. But generally speaking, it points to the start of something. Think of it that way. But you can move it around too. Um, how it's stored in memory depends on endianness. So who here knows what endianness is? So you guys know you've heard about it? Um, yep. So and for those who don't, endianness is a convention with how you lay out your bytes in memory. Do you lay them out the least significant to the most significant, or most significant to least significant in order in memory uh, increasing address? Intel uh, is Intel and ARM are little Indian. Mind you, ARM actually can do big Indian. It's a switch, but by convention, they all boot in little Indian mode. Um, all the OSs do that that I know of. So. Um, big Indian, MIP, Spark, um, PowerPC, 68K, um, they like to write things out in Big Indian. You need to know your Indianness and be aware of this, because when you write out binary data, you're going to have to be able to load it on a machine that might be of different Indianness. So you either have to, like TIFF does, I think, they actually may write in either Indianness, you don't know, but they have a way you can detect which Indianness the file is, and then you can interpret it the right way. Or what often happens is you always write the file in one endianness and it's defined. This file is written with this kind of endianness. Deal with it. And then if you're on big end, for example, you write in little endian. On big endian, you have to actually do the swapping when you load it into memory. Um, this is actually something interestingly that um, Microsoft is famous for. Because they were a traditionally a Intel-only operating system, all their products, like Office and Word and all these things, they will just write what's in memory straight out to disk. They wouldn't really care about bitterness, alignment, and, um, uh, da -da -da, and um, endianness. Because on Intel, you don't actually have to align things in memory. The hardware actually does alignment fix-ups for you. This doesn't happen on most other architectures. Um, you actually get, a, um, you get a, um, an exception. And either it crashes your program, or the kernel may trap it, fix it up for you, and it creates a huge slowdown. Um, so, but they would just write what's in memory and read it. But then when they actually have to support other platforms, they have to move from 32 to 64-bit, etc., etc. They actually do have to do a lot of work to make sure it keeps working because memory layout changes and things like that. If they had to, they, had to, they did actually um, have PowerPC, I think, at one point. And to support that is actually really hard, etc. ARM requires everything to be properly aligned in memory. So they had a lot of work to actually make sure their stuff works correctly, because they've been relying on Intel architecture being really lax in this department. Um, so this is why it's important to know, because if you want stuff that's going to run on your machine here, on some ARM tablet over there, or on some big fat server over there, imagine one day you have 128-bit servers, and pointers become 128 bits. OK, that's going to be ridiculous, but um, imagine they do. Um, you want your software to just magically work, um, if you do it right. So. Transfer also. Hmm? It took transfer also to your 
important role. Yes, well, it's just like writing the files to disk. If you're trans, it's the same thing. If you're then transferring across the network, you're right. Um, the other end might be a machine with a different endianness. You could, you, you know, most of your Wi-Fi routers you buy off the shelf today, they're MIPS. There's actually a CPU there. They run an operating system. Sometimes Linux, sometimes some BSD, sometimes something else. I don't know. Um, and you can talk to them. And guess what? They have a different endianness to your PC. Um, they're big. Your PC's little. Um, uh, they don't look at you. They don't uh, decode your data, so they just move it. Right? Um, no, they they don't. But if they were dealing with your data, or you had some kind of RPC to them that was binary, etc., 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 then you'd actually have to make sure you do that. Our binary RPCs are in fact a very good thing. They're very very efficient for a machine to decode. Um, Text-based ones are far more expensive because you have to examine every single byte to find out if the next byte is going to be the right thing, yes or no. So it's examine, figure it out, examine, figure it out, examine, figure it out. With binary, you go, I know the next thing is going to be a 32-bit integer. I know it. I don't have to make a decision. I already know because the previous thing told me the next n bytes are always exactly this sequence. I've got a header, and the header tells me it's this. Therefore, all of this is laid out like this in my memory. I can just mem copy it in and if my endianness is correct, I do nothing. If my endianess is not correct, I just blindly go swap, 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 and now I can use the memory as is. I don't have to do any compare branch, compare branch, compare branch, compare branch, etc. So that is one of the reasons why binary IPC or any sort of binary protocol generally will beat a text-based one over the internet. So if you care about performance, server performance, server performance. Um, protobuf. That's one. I, I, I can't tell you much about protobuf. I wrote one. Um, I wrote it for my desktop. Um, it wasn't actually a protocol. It was actually a serialization mechanism to take data structures and memory, write them to disk, and do the reverse. Take disk and write back to the memory. Um, and I've actually benchmarked mine against libjson, and it runs rings around libjson um, in terms of encoding and decoding data. Um, everything's like much smaller. I've got numbers somewhere on a web page, but like I think I came up somewhere between two and seven times faster, depending on the on what you're doing, writing, reading, blah blah blah. Mem the footprint is much much smaller. Like it's a fraction of the size for the same thing. Um, and I did I didn't optimize it for speed. I wrote it because I just wanted data structures serialized and deserialized. I didn't want to have a competition, but when a bunch of people saying yes, we're going to do libjson, blah blah blah, we're going to do all config in it, and I went. Now you're asking a bunch of people to do config in libjson who really care about performance. And these people will probably veto it. So before that happens, let's see if libjson is actually fast enough or not. So I did some comparison to something else I had that we were already using, and it was already fast. But although it could be faster and could be more compact. And libjson was already significantly slower. And my suggestion was, don't do this, because all you're going to do is take what we have and make it slower. You're not making it better. Um, so, but. Binary is not that easily editable by a human being. So there's actually a whole library with the binary one I have that actually will decode it for you into a text file and re-encode it for you. But the, saw, the actual file is in binary. So if the machine is reading and writing it all the time, you don't go through text every single time. You only go through text when a human has to actually deal with it. And there's a tool to do that. Um, so, da -da -da, um, so yeah, if you have something on memory, you have an integer there. Depending how it's laid out, if the number is like one, two, three, four, five, six, it might look like that in memory. Um, it might be uh, because the zeros won't be at this end; they'll be at the other end. That's actually a little endy in there. Um, a binary, oh, sorry, the binary representation of a string will be literally character, 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 and a null thing. Then you might have padding to the next data structure if we like to align things, and then like that might be like an integer of value one, and that's what it looks like in memory. Very handy to have. Ah, so um, C provides you ways of laying out your memory. They're called structs or data structures. Um, every language pretty much has this, but in C it's actually kind of useful to think about it as a way of saying, I've got a blob of memory, I'm going to name my memory, this bit is this, this bit is this, this bit is this, and this bit is this. That's really what a structure is doing. And they lay it out in certain ways. They like to align things. So you notice we have a gap here of grays. Of course I have a character and I have an int, it's going to want to align the int to a 32-bit value. So it leaves a gap there to keep that alignment. Um, 
And the same, I have a short here, there's a big gap over here until I have this pointer, which is 8 bytes on the 32-bit system. I have this 9-byte vowel thing here, which goes down to here. Again, it's going to align this to here, and so on, etc., etc. But all this is doing is describing how memory lays out. Uh, hmm? So what, what does the blank uh, memory look like? Is it, just, is it uninitialized, or is it usually... Undefined. It's not initialized, it's not, a not accessed. I kind of lie a bit on the second one. You can technically access it as long as you don't rely on the content in it. Um, and so you, who here knows debugging tools? Like, you know, G, have you heard of GDB? Yep. Do you know Valgrind? If there's one thing you come out of these two hours from, Valgrind, 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 Valgrind. It is the best tool on the planet. I owe those guys many cases of beer. Um, Valgrind is a CPU interpreter. It takes binary machine code and interprets it. And what it does is, as it's interpreting it, it examines everything it does, every memory access, every single thing, and what it accesses and has it been initialized or not. And it can tell you exactly what byte has and has not been initialized and if you accessed it or not. And it can tell you where it knows where it was initialized. It knows where you freed some memory. And if you go access memory freed, you're accessing that was freed over here. It is the most awesome debug tool on the planet. Valgrind, Valgrind, Valgrind. Send the guys lots of beer. Um, they are really awesome. Hmm? I think I have it at the end of this, but it's V A L G R I N D. Yeah. I think there was a tool I was using for like electric fence or something. Oh, eFence. fence. I, actually, at the very end, I covered that. eFence fence is ancient tool. It's an ancient tool. It's an interesting tool. Um, it's the same, it's the same job, right? Uh, no. Valgrind is byte accurate. It's accurate to the byte. Electric fence, all it does is every memory allocation you make, it basically uses memmap to do it and adds an empty page on either side with nothing mapped in there. So the idea is if you go beyond that page, like you go before a buffer or after a buffer, if you walk far enough, you'll hit an actual operating system empty page and then seg fault. But if you go just one byte over an allocation, it won't catch it. Unless that one byte is at the very end of a page, because then pages are rounded to 4K. Catch, uh, one byte. Uh, what? It'll catch one byte over. Oh, okay. It'll catch it because it, it looks, it flags and tags every byte in memory. It knows whether it's been initialized or not. So if you read a byte that hasn't been written to yet by your code, it'll complain saying accessing uninitialized stuff. So it actually does sometimes complain with some libc functions because what they do is something sometimes like stircomp or stircopy. They're optimized. So what they do is they don't read one byte at a time. They read four bytes or eight bytes at a time. And they read all of that into a register. And then they base their decisions on what's in that register. So Valgrind complains saying, you accessed uninitialized memory. And you go, uh, no, I didn't actually, because it's not going to use that memory. And due to the way memory is aligned, all allocations will always start at an alignment and be rounded to an alignment. So they'll, they will never be um, like, they won't be one byte allocations, even though theoretically, they don't really exist. They'll always have this extra padding space behind just for realistic use. And the way memory works, it knows that it's not going to go out of a real page of memory and crash when it does this access, because it's aligned in memory. But it masks out that stuff, and it doesn't access it. But the problem is Valgrind complaints. <laughs> it, no, it knows too much of what's going on. And sometimes you need to know these little tricks that people do. And it's a valid trick, and Valgrind is technically correct, but it's in practice wrong. And so you often have to do things like tell Vanglan to ignore that. <laughs> um, you have all these ignores listed like, no, that's okay. Or you just know you see it. It's like, it's complaining here and it never crashes really. And uh, you know it's going to stir this or stir that. And you go, oh, okay, it's Valgran. I know what it's doing. Um, so, but those, those things there, it's undefined content. And I think this is the trap that almost everyone falls into in C and C++. It's the undefined land. They start relying on things being defined that are not. You might assume that that memory is zero, or you might assume whatever, you can do certain things, and that assumption may not be correct. So don't make assumptions that you can't make. Um, be careful about that. So, do, 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 do. Yeah, it still doesn't work. Actually, I wonder if... And... Not, apparently not today. All right. Um, so if we were to have some code, everyone type this up now.
Okay, right, maybe not. <laughs> um, I would have loved to have uploaded it if the network worked. Um, so what was this? This is the data structure we had before. So at the top line, we have hash includes standard IO. I think we covered this before, but I almost skipped it. I skipped it. Hash includes in C literally are copy and paste. It's take, find the standard O file here and copy and paste it in this line and replace it. That's exactly what they are. They're copy and pastes. They're compile time copy and pastes. Um, the compiler goes and does this for you. So it's looking for that header file and the header file defines what functions exist in the standard IO set of things, like printf, for example. So they're now, after I've included that, the C compiler knows, is, oh, this printf function exists and it works like this. It accepts these parameters and so on. Therefore, now the compiler knows what to do with it. So that's what hash includes really are. They copy and paste. You can do really evil things like hash include, like hash include a C file in the middle of a block of code. And I sometimes do this as code generation systems. So you have a piece of code and you have a macro and you hash include different blobs of content and you basically generate different pieces of code as you go. Um, by using it as a trick. Um, but it's not a, not a bad trick to do. Um, it's perfectly valid to do that. Um, it's intended to be able to do that. So if we have this data structure, and that's how we've told the C compiler, this memory is laid out that way. Um, we can fill the data structure in like this. So we can set val 0 to 123, the next one to 99. I've used decimal here. Next one to 101. I've taken my myself, my own executable, as a string. And I've set that the pointer, the chaff val 3, to that. I've chosen really bad variable names here. I've done it for brevity and just for illustration. Um, I've now put a full string in, um, in stuff it over there that will fill that. And then another integer over there, another one, and a pointer to itself, just for illustration purposes. Um, and what we do here is we literally go find the memory address of where the data starts. So. Um, we've taken the, um, the data structure, the pointer of the address here, we've converted to an unsigned character, pointer. So we're going to look at a whole bunch of unsigned characters and walk through them. And do, 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 do. So we start with there and the end pointer is the base address plus the size of the data. So how big it is in bytes, however big the compiler decides that is. And we continue going until we hit the end pointer and then we iterate. And all we do is we just print out the hex value of it. So we're just rummaging through memory to see what's there. And we compile that like that. Oop, get out of the way. And you'll end up with something like that. Um, it'll just basically dump out in memory. You notice before the gray areas seem to be filled with zeros, like there's nothing in it. That's actually by kind of luck that that memory happened to be zero, but it might not necessarily be. So if we go look at highlighted before, those are the same colors as I had in the data structure before. Those are where those data structures live. But interestingly enough, this padding area here doesn't have zeros in it. It's got junk. And that was your question before. Um, uninitialized. It's uninitialized. There's random junk in that memory. Sometimes it's zeros. In fact, quite often it's zeros. But sometimes it's not because it's been recycled. It was used before, thrown away, then now it's used again and it's retaining previous junk in memory. Something to keep in memory for, in, for security. Hmm? Oh, and, um, actually, I'll, yeah, okay. I'll try yours if that works. Let me get rid of that. Oh, cool. No. Thank you very much. That'll save me walking back and forth. Um, so the same color we had before, the dark gray thing, has content, has junk. And as the longer your program runs, the more of memory that you fill in and do this stuff with will have more and more junk in it. So it's very important not to rely on memory containing something when you initialize it. You have to make sure it has something there. Did you do a green hmm? light? Maybe? No. Is the green light on, on the box? The, the red one has gone away. I mean, now it's on. Your red light's off. Oh, green light's off. <laughs> Green lights off. Hmm, nice. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure it's, it's on. Hmm? There's something wrong with your computer, I'd say. Try, try a different port. Do you have another one? No, no, no this, uh, this port's worked. <laughs> try now? Oh, okay, now it's working. All right. Maybe it was something else. Um, 
Okay, uh, da, da, da. Um, and there I've just gone through, so that's 123 there in hex, the first one as we initialized before, 99 there in the integer, 100, value 101, that's written in hex. That's the memory address of my first argument in memory. Oh, look at that, there's a bunch of zeros here, and a 7f, you'll, you'll get to know about these things later. Um, and there's a string, stuff it, over there in ASCII, um, the, the 1313 over there, there's a null byte terminator of stuff it, and there's some junk after, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so on. And that's the location in memory of where that data actually lives. Look at that, a 7f, 00, 7f, ooh, fd, ooh, look at that. Addresses near each other. The 00 for the end of stuff it is on the next one, right? Hmm? Do you understand that, right? Yes, that's the null byte here. That's the null byte of stuff it, the it's end of string. It's just gone, it's just long enough to go over this column here and just do there. And then this is the alignment oh, padding there. Okay. Yeah, right. That byte is actually part of the string, um, the null byte. Um, da, 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 da. So wait, wait, memory locations. Um, so when in C, in fact this is pretty much in every single language, when a function is called or any local scope is entered, it basically quote, quote, pushes that scope on the stack. A stack is just something where you start building, and you add something on top, you add something on top, you add something on top. Hmm? Uh, before before that, the alignment, right? Yep. Uh, the previous one. Alignment is based on the <laughs> processor's uh, uh, bus width, or, or what the alignment is, it's like 8-bit alignment. 8-bit um, alignment is byte alignment. <laughs> you mean 8-bit? You mean 8-byte? Uh, sorry. Byte alignment, or is it basically uh, is it 32 Depends on the type. Bytes must be aligned to bytes. Shorts must be aligned to a short. An int must be aligned to an int. Mm. A double must be aligned to a double. A pointer must be aligned to a pointer. So if a pointer is 8 bytes, it must be aligned to an 8-byte boundary. If it's a char, it can be aligned to any byte in, in memory. So the general rule is exactly that. They must be aligned. The asterisk is... is the type of the... Yeah. The type. The type you're about eat, the type must be accidentally aligned to its natural alignment value, which is its size. Um, Intel doesn't require alignment. And if you do an attribute packed at the end of your struct, you can tell it to pack it all down in memory. There is a very, very small performance hit of doing that, but Intel handles it. Other architectures don't even allow it. They just have an exception, and they might crash your program. But um, they get the processor cannot access memory at that address, which is kind of interesting. That's where you get a SIG bus sometimes in some architectures and you won't see an Intel. SIG bus is, instead of SEG fault, the bus signal is the memory is valid memory and it's within your memory range, but I can't get to it. And accessing an, an, a, a unit or a thing on an unaligned boundary on a system that doesn't allow unaligned access where there is no kernel trap for it, which the kernel trap is optional because it's very expensive, um, will get you a SIG bus. There's another reason you get a SIG bus, um, or another main reason, if you do memory mapped I.O. You have a file, you memory map it into memory, and then you access pieces of the file, and you have an I.O. error on disk, you'll get a SIG bus. You did a valid mapping, you did everything correct, but you'll get a SIG bus. Um, because the processor cannot page that into the memory mapping because there is an I.O. error on disk. Um, there's a few other little cases as well, but they're the main ones. Um, so, da, da, da. so every time you put go on the stack, you just actually add a blob of memory. You put more stuff into it. Actually, I should speed up. Um, so the more you put in the stack, the more it needs. So uh, how many of you learnt in the good old computer science days about recursion, right? And your computer science lecturers told you recursion's really awesome, and they wanted to use like functional languages like Haskell or Lisp or these kind of things to demonstrate how great it is, how you can solve all your, fi all your solutions with recursion. Problem is recursion is expensive. <laughs> Every single time the function calls itself, calls itself, calls itself, it adds more to the stack and it keeps using more memory. Remember what I said before, the more memory you use, the lower your um, performance goes because you have to access more of it. So it is not free. And believe it or not, stacks are not unlimited in size. There is eventually you'll hit the end of a stack and your machine will crash. You can't put more things on the stack. Um, so be careful to some extent how much you put in the stack and some systems will have much smaller stacks than others. Um, 16 megabytes these days is not uncommon on most PCs, but I've seen down in the rare area of 256K on a stack. It's to the point where I've had my code crash because I put these like 16 and 32K buffers in functions and they go on the stack 
and then you just call a few of those and you suddenly blow the stack. And that was actually QMU when it was doing its MISC binary emulation. Um, it did a pretty bad job of that and I was unhappy. But I, I redesigned it and used malloc instead. Um, move it into heap. Um, so, but when you exit the function, everything that was on the stack just goes away. Everything that was pushed there just gets popped. You are no longer allowed to access this. You can technically go and rummage that memory, but it's now undefined. <laughs> um, it's now going in an undefined land. And that's where you can get garbage because it'll, it won't clear it out. It'll just leave it there. What's the point of clearing it out? It doesn't matter because you see someone's going to overwrite it later again when they reuse it. Um, hmm? Stupid question here, hmm? but like uh, functional programming is all the rage in JavaScript. So does the same rule apply that if people start using more functional styles, then the, 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 their uh, stack will get bigger in, in, in those? It does tend to happen, actually. The more function heavy you are, the deeper your stack is. And JavaScript will be maintaining a stack. Hmm? Regardless of the language, I guess. Regardless of the language, any language I know of maintains a stack. Because you, you call into something and you have to go to the state. You've got to store it somewhere. The, the more uh, practical way is, is that, it's called imperative, right? Is that the right term? Uh, procedural? Yeah. Or? Kind of, yes. But even procedural languages can recurse. They can do it, so they can be functional. Low-level languages can be just as functional almost as functional languages. It's just how you use it. So it's not what you call it that counts, it's how you use it that counts. That's what makes things good. Um, so anyway, um, you can also dynamically allocate on the stack, decide how much you want, not just declare variables, and that's alloc A. Um, alloc, I don't know why they used A actually, no idea. Um, but that allocates n bytes on the stack for you somewhere when you need it. But be careful, don't alloc allocate too big things for the reasons that eventually you blow your stack. Um, so heap is basically everything else but stack. Um, normally you get this by calling a function called malloc. Um, my cat's name is actually also malloc. Everyone thinks that's really awesome. I named my cat after a um, C function. Um, and my next cat will be called free. Because you get rid of malloc by using free. <laughs> And you can also use calloc. Calloc is interesting in that it guarantees the memory is zero. Like all the bytes are set to zero by the time it returns it. Realloc changes the size of an allocation, but it may move it around in memory if needed. Thus it returns a new pointer to you. And memmap is an interesting one I'm not going to cover here. It's probably too advanced. And that's a way of going straight to the operating system and saying, give me memory. And it's expensive because it's a system call. Um, but it kind of moves memory outside of the normal libc memory heap allocation area and you kind of do it yourself. There are reasons you might want to do this, very special reasons and we can go into that later um, if you want to know. Um, but remember, if you're getting stuff from the heap, you have to remember to release it. It's your job to say, I don't need this anymore. That's what free is for. Um, so if you forget to do it, you're going to have leaks, it's going to be fun. Um, don't do that. Uh, so now this is the same code as before. Um, where did I put this? Doesn't like Valgrind tell you about the freeze? Or like Valgrind will track, uh, track all these functions and it'll, it can tell you if there is a pointer you have in memory and then you freed the data structure that contains the pointer and you haven't got that pointer stored anywhere else and it'll tell you you've leaked memory. You've lost track of that pointer because you forgot to free this one too. It can figure these things out. Valgrind is awesome. Best thing on the planet. Um, where is... Doo, 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 doo. Oh, okay. No, this is right. This is the same code as before, but with one change. I've called a pause function down here. Pause does exactly what it says. It pauses forever. It never comes back. But what it does, it waits for a system signal. You can, if you send a signal like kill minus hop, kill minus user one, kill minus one of these, then that will release the pause. It may also kill the process, depending if they're catching or not. Um, but I did this for a reason. So the process would start and not exit. So we compile it, and I can go look at the memory mappings of a process. We don't, I know I'm going through memory. Um, it's a useful thing to know. There's this wonderful tool called PMAP, print the mapping of a process. So print the, uh, the, give it a process ID of anything, and it'll print you this. It's, I chose a very, very simple application, so it's mapping is simple. Um, so if you can see here in red, that's where the stack is. And the stack has 136k mapping. 
That's all that's been given in its mapping. So you can probably blow the stack after we had 136k. Um, this here is some magic anonymous memory, 4k, read write, we don't know what it is. This thing, read and execute from libc. So when you run ps or top and you see some memory that uses 500 meg of memory, it probably doesn't. It might have mapped into memory things like these shared libraries. And everyone maps the same shared library into memory, which means this only exists once in memory. For every single application you run in your system, they all share libc. And that same bit of memory for libc is shared between every process you have. Um, it's not duplicated. So it's important to know, read and execute, that's a bit of code there. This is actually the, run, uh, the dynamic linker that figures out what to link in, like libc. That's also code there. Um, this here is probably some global variables. Um, this might be some other just constant variables, which so are not executable. Parts of the library, the same library across. The yeah, different parts of that file get mapped into different things. It's just like, this part of the file is now this part of memory. This is now this. This is now this, and it's just accessing that file directly. And modern. Why would the permissions yep. change? What's the? Why? Because you need you need execute permission for running executable code. You need write permission if it's something that actually can be written to, like global variables. If they're writable global variables. What happens is Unix does copy on write. So it first of all maps it in, in their current state in the file. Then when the first guy writes to it, it makes a copy of that, then releases it unless you write your one variable. Now you have a private copy. Um, but that's why it's read-write. If it's read-only, you try and write to one of the, you try and write to your code from libc, and it'll crash. It won't let you write, because it's not writable. And that's actually the right thing to do. So each different parts of these files gets mapped in differently. An anonymous memory is a way of going to the kernel and saying, map nothing in. I not an actual file, just give me anonymous memory, just give me pages. You don't have to back it onto a file. Give me stuff. And the kernel will do that. It'll give you fresh pages. The libc, malloc, and so on will use that trick to get large bits of memory. And otherwise, they'll use the another heap, where they use burk and spurk to, to move that around. This is obviously a shared uh, binary. If it was static, then uh, every, 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 the binary would have its own copy. Correct. Correct. There'd be a. Um, so the, see this read in Rx here? That's the code from that binary, right? So if it was static, this would be rolled into that and that would be a lot bigger. And the permissions would uh, be. Permissions the would be the same, yeah. Or so is that all the same as the binary? Hmm? The, the, everything here, the S5, this binary, that's the binary itself. So we've got some code here probably some constant values and some uh, read-write values, globals, that you can read and write to. They would, those would just become bigger if I'd statically compiled stuff in. And then you have less of these extra files mapped. Um, the other mappings will probably still be there, the anonymous ones and definitely the stack. So the LD will go, the LD.so will go away as well. LD.so is the runtime linker. That's the thing that everyone links to, and that then goes and finds libc and finds something else and finds something else and links them in before your main function is called. So that's its job. So even though it says there it's using 4.2 meg of RAM, it really isn't. It's actually probably using a tiny fraction of that. Um, so it's lying. So remember, this knowing how your memory looks is actually very useful to debugging and knowing if you're leaking and stuff like that. Um, so now we're going to do some simple file. Whoops. Hmm? Wait, wait, wait. Can't go back now. What was I? Okay. And why did I call that that? Why did I do that? Oh no, that's the file I was later. Never mind. I don't know why I have that there. Anyway, um, so when the stack goes up and down, it'll just increase and decrease the stack pointer size. Um, we'll go back to stack. Um, in this case, just plus or minus 16. Stacks may grow up or may grow down. Either they might start at a high address and then go down in value. They might start at a low address and go up. Going at a high address and coming down is actually quite common. But it's an abstraction. So I think of a stack growing up. We just turn it upside down in real life. Um, and the stack includes the, param the, fun the parameters you pass to a function. It also includes space for the return value and a return address. I, once you finish going through this bit of code here, where to jump the CPU to to continue where it started before it called the function. So the stack includes this data. Um, it's a, and local variables in each scope, as we were talking about before. So here is a little program I wrote to just quickly dump through memory. There's good reasons why I put a lot of hex in here, like 7777 and 8888 and 909 and so on. So at the top, I just have a function to dump memory. 
So basically, it goes from some pointer to some pointer, just printing out whatever's in memory, um, rummaging around through it. You can, you can do this if you want to. It's kind of not valid, but on a machine level, it actually is valid. Not valid conceptually, but valid in practice. Um, and I just have a function, as we were doing before, talking about before, we recurse, actually. Recurse in a very limited way. So we start, if you go down, I pass in this hex value, 1110, um, three, the counter, and then just a pointer to the top data value. And then in this function, I have some local data. data. Um, if count has gone to zero, I dump memory and just return. Um, otherwise, I return the value from my function and I decrease. Um, three, two, one, and when it gets to zero, it'll just then go head back because count has now gone to zero, and it'll increment the, increment the parameter count. So if you run this, compile it, you run it, you'll end up with memory like this. That's your stack. That's what's sitting there. A lot of zeros. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't really aligned right. There's a reason for this, so I just shifted it over a little bit to make it easier to read. Huh? Why? Where's my highlighting? Why is my highlighting gone? What is that? Open office or something? LibreOffice. Why has it lost a whole bunch of my... I don't know why it's lost a lot of highlighting. That's weird. I literally was downstairs, I had this. Um, you'll know, okay, I'll do this by hand here. You'll notice some of the hex values I had before, 7777 is lurking there. Um, you'll notice the start address and end address, 7FFF or whatever, that's where one of the um, addresses are. And if you look carefully, you should find a 7F, an FF7F somewhere here. Here we go. Um, FF7F, uh, well, FF -F, blah, 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 and actually continues in the previous line. That's actually zero padding up there. And if you look back here, it'll be then D3, D3, BB, BB. You'll see that there's a bunch of pointers there sitting in the stack. So they're referring either to a return address, they're referring to a variable on the stack, like maybe the top data, etc., etc. But most of the stuff is living there in stack. Um, and okay, that was fixed for alignment there. Um, so now it's easier to see that this here is actually a pointer, but you know it's just written in reverse um, because of little India, etc., etc. So all the data is there if you go rummage through. So whenever you call, it'll grow. In this case, think of the stack growing down. Function zero calls function one, calls function two, calls function three, calls function four. Every time you'll just add something to the stack, you'll hit return address, frame pointer, parameters, and local variables in there. Um, now, important thing: buffer overflows. Everyone here has heard of buffer overflows, right? Buffer overflows are silly things, like you have the variable stuff here, and what happens is you go S-T-U-F-F -F, and you don't stop. You continue walking through the buffer. And if you're writing to it, you walk through here, then you start writing through this memory and start writing through this memory and write and write and write and write and write. And you can modify the return address. For example, use the return address and jump to a different function. And that can actually have you then be able to pass parameters to that function even, and then execute something. Like, you run the system function and pass it bin sh, you know, rm minus rf slash. <laughs> and that is how buffer overflows in principle work. They find someone who hasn't checked their buffers and just goes writing over it, and then modifies it. They basically nuke the stack, they do something bad, and then they get the machine to do something it wasn't intended to do. You do need to know how memory is laid out to do this stuff. So if you want to be a security researcher, you need to know this stuff. Um, and if you want to protect against this stuff, you also need to know it if you want to write good code. So that's how buffer overflows in principle kind of work, um, or one of them. But no, I actually kind of lied to you. Not all parameters are always passed in the stack. They're conceptually passed in the stack. There are optimizations where they'll use those CPU registers to pass them. So you might find they're not visible. Or what you do is they find that they're the parameters of the previous function that get written out to the stack to save them because the registers are reused for something else. So if you only go one level deep, it might not have to save anything out. Um, it might just be able to use the registers if it doesn't use enough local variables. Um, 
So the return values also can be passed in registers, but it depends on your architecture and your ABI, basically. Um, so as we were talking about before, CPU, registers, memory. Um, this is where your variables sit in the CPU, where you have direct access to them. So as I said, 32, 64 bits. Um, you get instant access to this stuff. Uh, you have to generally move data from RAM to, to the register and then back again. Um, note. Some CPUs have some instructions that can access memory directly. I add this value to this pointer, whatever's pointed to this thing. So you use the pointer here, and the CPU will access it, go and do that for you, and hide it. And it won't have to use a register to store it in first. Um, but the best way to think of it is that the data does have to be loaded from memory, maybe to an invisible unknown register, and then written back out. Um, variables get assigned to registers on the fly out which variables get assigned there. Um, it's kind of invisible to you. You can hint for a variable to get a register by putting register in front of it, register int i, um, for example. Uh, da, da, da. So the compiler takes care of it, and the chances that you could do better than the compiler are effectively zero. Um, compilers will do a very, very good job here. So don't worry about that. But an example here is that if you have three variables here, i, j, and k, and you do these three loops, the compiler is not going to go and need three registers for i, j, and k. It'll probably recycle the same register for i, j, and k, because it doesn't need them anymore afterwards. So and if they're not actually ever used after that, the compiler knows that, and it'll just use one register for all of it. So don't get into the thought that the more local variables you have, the more registers you need. It doesn't work that way. It's, it basically is the number of active things you have in registers at the same time, like the content. So heap memory, now we're going to pass stack. Heap memory, that's where we store permanent things. Or permanent, as you might say. Um, it doesn't really have a structure like a stack. It's just random all over the place. How it's structured is totally system dependent. And it may actually depend on the size of your allocation and when you allocate it and how often you allocate it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you have to track every allocation. Um, it must be done. libc provides functions for this. So malloc, calloc, realloc, and free. They're basically your main set that you'll use. You'll probably use malloc and free mostly at the beginning, and then every now and again stray into realloc and eventually discover calloc and go, oh, I didn't know that. My hint is don't wait to discover calloc. It's awesome. Use it, to use it day one. Calloc guarantees your memory is zero. So you know I said before, you can't rely on guarantees. Don't, unless someone's giving you a guarantee, and that gives you one. Um, calloc is good because it can also optimize. I, if it's already zeroed, it won't re-zero it for you, if it knows that. Um, so here's an example. Um, just like allocate some memory. Uh, da -da -da -da, what did I do? I fill that memory with uh, like a, some character from that. I keep looping around like every 10 characters, pick one, and then just print it out. So malloc and then freeze at the end. That's how it works. Um, realloc, you take some data. Um, and then you want a bigger one, go and say, I want a bigger one. Notice it may return null. What happens if this returns, if I said data equals realloc data? I'd lose my pointer. I'll leak memory. I no longer have a pointer to data. I've lost it. I can't even free it. So that's why you'd always use another pointer for the return for realloc. And if it returns null, then um, handle the error, blah, 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 use an abort there. Calloc makes everything the same thing, but its parameters are different. It has a count and then a size. So how many of what? How one lot of one megabyte there. Um, and please make give me all zeros. Nice and simple. Um, so calloc is awesome, remember, guarantees that zeros. I use it a lot because it basically saves you from bugs. You don't have to remember to initialize every single value um, in a data structure that you're allocating memory for. It has guaranteed it's all been zeroed out. Yes? What's the point of using malloc instead of calloc? If you absolutely know you are about to fill this memory yourself, then there's no point having someone else fill it for you, then you refill it. Now, for data structures, notice I said data structures. If I'm allocating a lot, like 15 megabytes of memory for an image with pixels, I don't care. It's first of all 15 megabytes. I don't want someone to go zero my 15 megabytes of data. That costs. And it's pixels, so if there's a bit of junk there, you'll see it, but it won't crash the application. You'll just see some junk. But I'm going to fill those pixels with something anyway and render to it. So I don't want it to do it. 
So that's kind of my dividing line. If it's a smallish data, if it's a small data structure, I'm going to use calloc. If it's a data structure I'm continually allocating all the time, I might avoid calloc and specifically initialize it to specific values by hand, or I want to avoid the overhead. Um, otherwise, in larger things, I'll use malloc, but I'll be careful about it. I'll pick and choose which one I try and do. Note, realloc, if you realloc memory you calloced before, it doesn't guarantee the extra memory it extends is zeroed. So realloc doesn't give you those. There's no magic realloc or whatever. Um, but the main, main reason to use calloc instead of malloc plus mem set to set the memory to zero is because calloc can optimize if it knows this is fresh memory from the system. The kernel will guarantee all fresh memory to use zeroed for security reasons. Checking if the memory has been used since the system or how does it know that it's already zero? Any new memory given to your process is zero. The kernel guarantees this for security reasons. Otherwise, you'd be able to see in other people's old memory what they had there. Imagine some other process running as some other user ID and the password was in their memory. Now you happen to get their old memory and it's like, oh, password, thank you. No, of course not. Yes, so yeah, yeah. Um, yes, so it may reuse your own and that's where you get junk. Um, yeah. um, so also libc is the basic toolbox. It's really basic. It's not really great. Um, but don't stop at libc, but it will do your basic I.O., fop and fclose, do man memory management, malloc, and so on, string handling. They're kind of really painful. I hate doing strings in C. Just avoid strings. Just don't do it. Um, and all the POSIX system calls, like read, write, memmap, blah, 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 fsync, kill, and so on. Um, but beware, an actual system call is expensive. You go into the OS and come back out, you may lose, like, thousand cycles, two thousand cycles, easily. Um, and often you might even get your TLB flushed, which means all your caches are now no longer hot with your own data and they've got to be refilled again. So system calls hurt. Don't do system calls if you don't have to. And there's tons and tons of other libraries out there. Don't stop at libc. C has so many libraries it's not funny. And you should use it because this saves you time. So EFL is one I work on. It does data structures, I.O., network I.O., and other loop handling, GUI, rendering, and so on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Glib um, does data structures as well, um, and I.O., like main loop handling. GTK is uh, often used together and just does the GUI side. There's libjpg for jpeg doing libpng, zlib compression, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A whole bunch of them, like OpenGL for graphics, you want to do rendering, it deals with accessing the hardware for you, etc., etc. Uh, free type, font rendering, and so on. There's lots of libraries. Use them. Don't rewrite it yourself. If you rewrite it yourself, your life will be painful. Um, don't do unless you know what you're doing. Okay, now, file I.O. Um, these are the basic libc file I.O.s. This one is just going to open a file for read mode. It's a string, whatever, f open. I don't know why they did that, but they do. And one I'm going to open for write. It's going to use the first argument. And the second argument, so it copies file one to file two, basically, a really simple file copier. And it's basically going to read into the buff. I use the size of to know what the size of this buff is. Read and write, read and write, read and write, and just print it out. It's not hard to write a copier. It's very basic. If you read someone's code that does this, you read it and go, okay, I understand that. And the nice thing about C is you can read people's code and generally understand what it's doing. Um, it's generally not that mysterious. And if you run it, it just does that. It tells you what's writing at the end. It didn't quite get a full 1024 bytes. It got 768, um, and it wrote it. Now, this was a more interesting one. Um, this uses a library, Zlib. Zlib is a compression library. It compresses and decompresses. So as you can see up here in red, I've included the Zlib header. So I've said, please get me functions that are from Zlib. And now I'm using these functions are from Zlib. Um, how do you know they're from Zlib? Well, the way I know is I read this file, zlib.h. It actually has a documentation in the file in comments. So just go there. It'll show you the functions, and next to the function, it has comments telling you what the function does. Um, go read it. I don't understand why people don't read more header files. The first thing I do when I have a library is read its header files, because I'm looking for the functions, the definitions, and um, some documentation that probably should be there. And all we do now is we find out what our compressed buffer size should be. Um, if we have this buff, how, big we should, how much bigger it should be. Um, we open again, we open a file here, open a file here, we read it. Now, if we actually manage to read, we go and compress this 
into, sorry, this into the compressed buffer, so it goes from here to here, read the documentation, you want to know what it does. And then we write, it, we write out the size of the compressed data, because it'll be different each and every time. We write out a um, size of desk size, which is in fact a long up here. Um, and then we write the actual compressed data. So you're basically writing a small header, which is how big it is, then blob of data, how big it is, blob of data, how big it is, blob of data, um, and so on. So you end up with something like that. So every time it writes out, not 1024, but 313, 540. So you can see the compression of the file changes as you go. Different parts compress better or worse, um, et cetera, et cetera. Did you compress the whole file before writing it out? Or I didn't quite get it. I was compressing as I was writing. So you, I read 1,024 bytes, compressed it, wrote out what it managed to compress. But when you're using it, normally you would compress the whole thing, or would you do it that way? You would probably do larger chunks, but you're normally doing it chunk by chunk by chunk. Yeah. Um, oh, it's not a, like a stream. Um, this is done in chunks. There's reasons to go later. Um, so as I said, I've included Zlib, and the one thing you have to do is tell the compiler to link to that library, minus LZ. Um, again, read the documentation for your libraries. It'll tell you what to do. There are wonderful systems that kind of hide this from you in a standardized way. Don't have time in this thing to cover that. Um, but basically, generally, my LZ, LZ, LibZ, LibM, Libina, Lib, Smelly Skunk, um, they work the same way. <laughs> um, it's very simple. Um, so I don't think we're going to be doing the exercise. I was going to say, how, to, as an exercise, try and um, modify it to decompress the file we just compressed. Um, so I get you to do that, but we don't have tables here, so I think anyone's going to do it anyway, and we don't have much time. Um, that is actually the reverse. That will decompress what I just compressed. Um, and that will do again. We'll open it, we'll read it, um, we'll look at files, we'll use the, um, where is it, the, um, where's the uncompressed function there? We'll uncompress that chunk, and we'll write it back out, and it will produce the same file from the beginning again. So it's not that hard to do. And then close the stuff, close our files at the end, etc. Um, there are some things wrong with what I wrote. Uh, I don't check the results of fopen. <laughs> It'll return null if the file isn't there or it can't open a right file to write. Um, I use unsigned longs to write them, which is system dependent. So if I'm 32 bit, 8, uh, 32 or 64 bit, also Endian is specific, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I could have made it shorter and written, uh, written like 16 bit headers because they will be big enough for the chunks we have. They'll never be more than the value of 1024, um, or not too much more. Um, do, 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 do. Um, I don't look for short reads on decompress. I assume if I have a header and it says this many bytes followed, they will happen. I don't handle that error case um, when there's actually like file IO error there. Um, do, 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 do. Um, I don't check my malloc results. Bad man, I'm a bad man, you should check. Um, although sometimes you don't really need to check. It returns null, you use a null pointer, you're trying to access a null pointer, your machine will crash. That's okay, or your process will crash. If you were going to abort or crash anyway, yeah, whatever, um, it'll be the same thing. And I probably could have used the binary write and binary read. Yes, it's a stupid thing from the days where you could read access files as ASCII as opposed to binary. That doesn't happen anymore. Um, so the advanced topics, um, you can do functions and address them by pointer. Functions are just addresses. They just live somewhere in memory. You can have the pointer pointing to a function. Um, it just exists somewhere in memory. You say call whatever is here at this address. Um, it's a good way to indirect things. Um, you can basically say call this something sometime later when the thing is done. Uh, so you can store a function. And that kind of makes C a function language. This is kind of what you're getting at before. Um, you can store functions and then indirect and call them later. Um, so they're called callbacks often because you call them back just like on a phone. Um, why did it go back there? Um, so that's an example. I created a type def for a function. I just stored functions in an array. And then I actually do ASCII to integer, take your first argument. If I passed in 0, I would have called func1. If I passed 1, I'd call func2. If I passed in 2, I'd call func3. It's just based on which one I call. Um, even more advanced. Wait, why did it go back? Anyway, um, you can do OO in C. Um, so you combine structs, function pointers, type def, heap, heap allocation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, many people do this. The Linux kernel has O in it. They use like structs with function pointers, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to basically define which function handles the reading and writing and this and that of something. Um, GTK does it. Um, they use glibs, gobjecting. EFL does it. There's an EO thing for that. 
Um, and this is just like a really simple example of one I brewed up. This is the very last thing. Um, and I've, just, I've actually created a object and a public type. The public type is a set of functions I expose. Um, the object, the beginning of the struct, has the public type, the public functions, and then some private data inside the function. So here's my implementation. I just define some functions that they actually exist. I have created a class here, and the class I just say, this class, this is a create function, this is a destroy function, this is a set text function. Um, then I actually have the function implemented over here, blah, 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 blah. And over here, in OO style, I would do class.create, create an object, or object pointer, set text, yes, I do have to pass an object again, and text, and I can do destroy. Now, if you do that and you have the same struct at the beginning with the same open close and everything, you basically do inheritance because the pointers are in the same Laker locations in memory, so you can call destroy and et cetera, et cetera on any object that inherits from the same class. And so that's kind of how you do OO and C. Yes, you can get more elaborate. So anyway, um, I didn't cover a lot of stuff. GDB, Valgrind, we actually did cover. Electric fence, we actually did cover. You pointed it out. Um, and most of it's just putting tools together, so making something better. Um, done. <laughs> Just on time. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to say to you that whether if you're not done yet, I, I just called for the room and I wanted yeah. to make that way only. So, because you guys saw everything. No, I, I did. I just, I, I, perfect timing. Yes. Perfect timing. I've done.